Welcome to section 16.10. Now there isn't a quiz in this particular lecture video, however it does go across some very important concepts, so please make sure you understand the topics that we are about to discuss. All right, gentle people, what we're going to do is try to look at a topic that we've discussed before. Now, this stuff was hinted at in Chem 1B, and we're going to return to our heating curve. And so just to remind you, here is our heating curve. And what we are doing here is we are inputting energy or heat into our system. And as a result, what we are going to do is we are going to go through phase changes. So in this particular example, we're going to start out with water. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with water as a solid material at around negative 20 degrees. Now, when I start inputting energy, what you guys will note is that I'm going to heat up the material and I'm going to use the formula Q equals MC delta T i.e. the temperature of the material is going to go up. And what we did in Chem 1B is we kind of focused on when we have the material and us increasing the temperature of that material. Now, what we did is we skated around one kind of issue, and that was what happens at the phase change, i.e. what happens when I go from one physical state of matter to another physical state of matter. Now, just to remind you, when I go through a phase change, the temperature remains constant. So I'm doing an isothermal process. Now, you might have been wondering where that heat and energy are going and what they are doing. So now that we've discussed intermolecular forces, what we can say is that the energy that I'm providing, the input of energy is used to overcome the intermolecular forces, or in other words, I'm gonna break those attractive uh, forces and push these things apart from each other. Now, right here, you guys can look at all the names of our phase change going forward and backward. Now, just to remind you of some things that were hinted at when we discussed this in Chem 1B, and that was we have enthalpies associated with these various processes. So if I were to go ahead and start with a solid and I were to turn it into a liquid, what I would have to do is put energy into my system. So if I wanted to put energy in my chemical equation, what I can say is heat is going to be on the reactant side. Now, the amount of energy that I put into the system for this process to occur, that's going to be the heat of fusion. That's the amount of energy that needs to be absorbed to change a solid into a liquid. Now, what you guys will note is if I want to do the reverse process, if I want to freeze liquid water, well, that's me essentially uh, reversing the equation, and if I flip or reverse the equation, well, I just have to change the sign of my delta H. So in this case, if I want to go ahead and look at the delta H of freezing water, it would be negative 6.02 kilojoules. Now, if I were to go from a liquid to the gaseous state, this is called the heat of vaporization. And again, if I were to do the reverse process, well, I would just have to reverse that number, and that would be negative 40.7 for the condensation of water. Now, with this in mind, we're going to delve a little bit deeper into these phase changes and what is exactly happening here. So let's continue to use water as our example to describe the concepts in this particular section. So what we're going to have is we're going to have H2O liquid, and it is going to be in equilibrium with H2O gas. Now, if I take a look at this, we have two rates. We have the rate going forward and the rate going backwards. Now, the rate going forward is going to be H2O liquid going to H2O to the gaseous state. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a little Erlenmeyer flask right here. Now, in this Erlenmeyer flask, I'm going to seal the top over there. And at the start, I'm not going to have any kind of gas. So that's going to be completely evacuated. So what's going to happen here is that at the surface of the liquid, 
some of these liquid molecules are going to have enough energy to escape and fly off into the headspace of my container. Now remember, this is a Boltzmann distribution, so I will always have a certain amount of liquid that have, has enough energy to escape. Now what you guys will notice is that this rate is going to be independent of any kind of concentration because I have a liquid right here. So it doesn't matter how much liquid I have, what matters is the amount of surface area I have. And so this rate is going to be constant. The rate of evaporation is only dependent on the amount of surface area my liquid has. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the reverse reaction. My reverse reaction is H2O gas goes back to H2O liquid. So what's gonna happen is as I start evaporating more and more liquid, I'm gonna get gas particles. And these gas particles are gonna ricochet back and forth. And what's gonna happen is they're going to interact with each other and some of them are going to go ahead and condense and that gas is gonna become liquid water. Now what you guys will note here is this is where concentration is going to matter. At the start of me sealing this container, what you guys will notice is there's not a lot of gas molecules, so they can't collide together and start condensing. But as I evaporate more and more and more, what you guys will notice is the concentration of my gas particles increase. And as I increase that concentration, the rate of condensation is going to go up because I'm increasing the amount of gas particles I have eventually what's going to happen is I'm going to reach equilibrium where the rate of the evaporation is going to equal the rate of condensation. Now we can go back to thermodynamics, back to Chem 1B. What we can say is that there is an equilibrium constant associated with this equilibrium. And that is going to be based off of not the liquids, but only the gas. So the equilibrium constant is going to be just the pressure of H2O gas in this case. And so that's gonna be my equilibrium constant. What you guys will notice is that this equilibrium constant, this pressure has a special name. This is called the vapor pressure of my substance. The vapor pressure of my substance is the equilibrium pressure once I put this material in a sealed container. It is the partial pressure of that evaporated material. So again, let's go ahead and think about equilibrium, things that we discussed in Chem 1B. So again, here is my equilibrium equation. And remember, I have an equilibrium constant associated with this, and this is going to be the pressure of H2O gas meaning this is my equilibrium constant. Now, what you guys will notice is that K, my equilibrium constant, is constant so long as I keep my temperature the same. Now, if I were to go ahead and increase my temperature, well, I'm gonna go ahead and change my equilibrium. Now, what you guys will notice is that heat is on the reactant side. So as I increase my heat, my pressure is going to go up. And so that means my equilibrium constant is going to go up, but what we are discussing is vapor pressure. And so if I were to look at vapor pressure as a function of temperature, as I increase the temperature, my vapor pressure is going to go up and up. And this should make sense to you guys if you guys have taken a glass of water and you start heating up that glass of water, what you'll notice is you start to generate more and more gas as you increase that temperature. Now what we can do is we can go ahead and look at how equilibrium and temperature are related to each other. So here's the Van Hoft equation. Now remember Van Hoft is looking at equilibrium constants. Instead of K2 and K1, what you guys could substitute in there are the vapor pressures in T2 and the vapor pressure at T1, because remember, the vapor pressure is the equilibrium constant when discussing this type of equilibrium. 
So with this, what you can do is you can predict the vapor pressure at another temperature so long as you have the vapor pressure at one certain temperature and the enthalpy of vaporization. So it would be a very good idea for you guys to review the Van Hoft equation that we discussed in Chem 1B. So let's go ahead and talk about something called the boiling point. Now what we've discussed so far is a closed container and the equilibrium pressure in that closed container. Now the effect of boiling where you see bubbles rise out of a liquid and escape into the atmosphere, well that only occurs if the vapor pressure equals the external pressure. So what I need to have happen is I need to be in an open system. If you think back to that Erlenmeyer picture that I have, I want to take that stopper off and let it open to the atmosphere. Now it will start boiling when that vapor pressure equals that external pressure. Now the normal boiling point is set at 1 atm or 760 torr. Now us at Santa Barbara, we are very close to the atmospheric pressure. And so what you guys observe most of the time is things boiling near their normal boiling point. However, if you were to go to places that have a higher altitude like Colorado or inside the Rocky Mountains, what you guys will notice is the atmospheric pressure is much lower. Water and other substances will boil at a much lower temperature. This is part of the reason why you see packaged food give different instructions for when you are cooking in higher altitudes. Things are gonna boil at much lower temperatures, meaning you're not transferring the same amount of energy as if you are at a different altitude. Now let's go ahead and relate our vapor pressure to our intermolecular forces. So remember, the vapor pressure is the amount of material that has escaped at equilibrium. So if I have stronger intermolecular forces, well, it's harder for molecules to escape the liquid or condensed phases, so that means my vapor pressure is going to be much lower. Now, if my vapor pressure is much lower, that means that I'm going to have to increase the temperature for it to actually boil, and so my boiling point will go higher. Now, if I have much lower intermolecular forces, well, that means the molecules are easily escaping. They're not sticking to each other, and so they're flying off which means that low intermolecular force compounds have a very high vapor pressure. If I'm making a lot of vapor, well, it's real easy to match the external pressure, and that means I will have a lower boiling point. And that's what you guys will see in this graph over here. If we were to compare diethyl ether and water, what you can say from the graph is diethyl ether has a higher vapor pressure than water at any given temperature. And so that means that diethyl ether has to have lower intermolecular forces. Now, if I were to go ahead and draw the picture for you guys, water H2O, what you guys would say is this has H bonding, this has dipole-dipole, and it has LDF forces. On the other hand, we can take a look at diethyl ether. I can draw a simplified Lewis dot structure of this compound, and what you guys will see is that this is a polar compound. Now this polar compound has dipole-dipole interactions, and it has LDF. So it has less intermolecular forces, and that means a higher vapor pressure. Now, liquids aren't the only thing that have a vapor pressure. So what I can do is I can take a solid piece of material and run that same experiment. Now, what you guys will notice is that a solid piece of material, what it will have are certain molecules at the surface of that solid. Now, again, we have that Boltzmann distribution. So some of these particles will have enough energy to escape the matrix of the rest of the solid. If that occurs, well, they escape into the vapor phase. Now, I'm going to warn you that the vapor pressure of a solid material is extremely low. 
But what happens is that solids do give up a little bit of vapor. And so that is going to be the vapor pressure of the solid. Now let's go ahead and talk about this concept of melting. And that's where the solid goes into the liquid phase. Now what's really occurring here is that the vapor pressure of the solid equals the vapor pressure of this liquid. Now when this occurs, I'm gonna have the equilibrium between these two parts. Now again, if I wanna go from the solid to the liquid, this is called the enthalpy of fusion, the amount of energy I have to provide to get there. When we talk about phase changes, we are looking at what is thermodynamically the most stable physical state of matter, whether solids are more stable, liquids, or gases. Now, what we gotta remember is that kinetics is always a factor. And so what we can do is we can go under effects of supercooling and superheating. So let's take a look at what this process means. Now, if I were to cool a liquid, and let's say I have liquid water, and at zero degrees, well, that should become solid ice. Now, if I cool my material so fast, what can happen is instead of becoming ice, it will become liquid water that is below zero degrees Celsius. And the reason is, is for me to form ice, I need those liquid molecules to attach to each other, get attracted, and then, and then form the solid ice. So what I need to have happen is something called nucleation. And that is where one liquid molecule locks into place with another liquid molecule and so on and so forth. And so once they lock into place, then I make that solid material. But they have to be in a specific place for it to actually make the solid material. And so it takes a little bit of time, it takes a little bit of rearrangement to get there. Now, if I cool it fast enough, it doesn't have time to lock into place, and that's where I super cool my liquid. Now I'm gonna try to put a cute little uh, YouTube video here so that you guys can see this, and I'm gonna warn you that it's like so 90s, but just go ahead and stomach the music and their overuse of text flying in with visual effects. Now we can also do the process in the other direction and that's what's called superheating. And that is if I take liquid water and I heat it above its boiling point. Now you guys may have done this inadvertently using your microwave. If you've ever taken a cup of water, put it in the microwave, and then all of a sudden you take that cup of water, it's super hot, that water might be above 100 degrees Celsius, meaning I have a liquid that is existing above its boiling point. Now, if you take that hot cup of water, you might have put in a tablespoon of sugar or some kind of powdered drink, and what you would see is it all of a sudden bursts into a whole boil. And again, that is that process for it to boil. What I need to have happen is a gas molecule has to escape all that liquidness. And so that takes time, and so this is in a kinetic effect. Now, both these things are kinetic effects. Eventually, what will happen is that I will not have liquids above uh, their boiling points, and I will not have liquids below their freezing points. I hope that made sense. And again, stay safe, Cam1C.